capitalism versus socialism. And our first speaker will be Yaron Brook. I'd like you to check out his podcast, uh, The Yaron Brook Show. His latest book is called Equal is Unfair. Great title. <laughs> uh, and he will be followed by Josh Holroyd from Marxist.com and Socialist Appeal. And you can get hold of their podcast at INTV Podcast. So INTV Podcast on YouTube as well. And the floor for 10 minutes each, opening statements, five minutes rebuttals, then a ongoing debate for a bit, and then we come to you for a QA. and a Yaron, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, um, and thank you all for coming. This is amazing to see such a great uh, turnout out here. Although, I have to say that it's a little shocking to me. The very fact that here we are in the 21st century, and we have to debate this issue, is quite shocking. I mean, it's funny, maybe, but it's shocking. Because my reading of history is that the debate has been over for decades. Socialism, everywhere, every time, to the extent that it is practiced, is a massive, unequivocal failure. And I don't mean just that, you know, higher unemployment or economic growth is slow. I mean, people die. I mean, people, a lot of people die. And to ignore that fact about socialism is to ignore history. Socialism kills. Socialism is killing people right now in Venezuela. Now, I know we're going to hear a lot about how Venezuela is not socialist. So maybe we should define our terms. Socialism, in my view, is the system from an economic perspective that redistributes large quantities of wealth from those who have, those who are able, to those who need. And the system where the means of production are either nationalized or collectivized, given over to the workers. By those standards, you know, study your history, study your facts, Venezuela fits it beautifully. And indeed, what you get in Venezuela is death, starvation, poverty, an utter, complete, unequivocal failure. But that shouldn't surprise everybody, anybody, because that's the whole history of socialism. Everywhere, at any point in time, no matter who the people are, no matter what continent it's on, it fails. Whether it is the experiment of the Soviet Union with communism, or whether it's the experiment of China, Vietnam, you go on and on. Or Sweden. Because Sweden used to be socialist. Isn't it anymore. But it used to be socialist. From about 1960 to about 1994, Sweden nationalized certain industries, increased redistribution of wealth massively. And while in Sweden it didn't kill, the Swedes stopped it before it started killing people, it drove them bankrupt. And by 1994, Sweden took a sharp turn away from socialism. They still redistribute wealth more than most, but they privatized pretty much everything. Even schools, now they have vouchers for schools. They have more school choice than we do in America. In many respects, on many parameters, Sweden today is more capitalist than America is. So the history suggests, and the present suggests, that socialism has, is, and I believe inevitably always will be a complete and utter failure. But it's not just the economics of it. It's not just the politics of it. It's the ethics of it. The essential characteristic of socialism and all statist ideology 
is that the individual at the end of the day does not matter. Your achievements, your creation, your progress, you as an individual don't matter. What matters is the group, the proletarian, if you're a Marxist, the collective, the global collective. You can have the group, whatever you want to define it. But socialism's essential characteristic is the sacrifice of the individual for the sake of the collective. And they're very good at sacrifice. They're brilliant at sacrifice. That's why you have the deaths and destruction, the ultimate sacrifice of some for the sake of others. Socialism rejects implicitly the idea of individual human achievement, the idea of desert, that what you create is yours, the idea that private property is essential for human life, which it is. And we can get in more into this, but so I think socialism is wrong, it's anti-life, it's immoral, both from a practical perspective and from a moral philosophical perspective. But what makes the fact that we need a debate so utterly shocking even more to me is the fact that capitalism has been so unbelievably successful wherever, whenever, and to the extent that it has been tried. Everywhere and every, in every place, every continent, every ethnic group that has tried even just a little bit of capitalism has been incredibly successful. Now let's define capitalism. What is capitalism? Capitalism is the system in which all private property, all property is privately held. It's a system in which the government protects our freedoms. Not freedom as, so our freedoms as freedom as freedom from coercion. Where the government protects us from crooks and criminals and fraudsters. It protects our individual rights as luck defined them and otherwise leaves us alone. And in that respect, there's never been a capitalist society a pure capitalist society, and I acknowledge that. But to the extent that capitalism is tried, it succeeds. You might argue there's never been a pure socialist economy, fine. But the fact is that to the extent socialism is tried, it fails. And all you have to do is look at the world around us, at history. 250 years ago, 95% of the globe's population, of Western Europe's population, the globe, it was probably 99%, lived on $2 or $3 a day or less, what the United Nations defines as extreme poverty. Something happened about 250 years ago. Call it capitalism. That's what it was. We started limiting the role of government, and we started freeing up the innovators, the entrepreneurs, the scientists, to build and create and make. And the consequence of that is that nobody in the West lives on $3 a day or less. And the number of people in the world living on $3 a day or less is shrinking dramatically to the point where, according to the United Nations, not an organization they usually cite, there will not be any people living on that. I mean, any, there will always be some, but any within 20 years. Why? Well, because capitalism creates huge amounts of wealth. Everybody gets richer under capitalism, not at the same rate. Inequality is a feature of capitalism. Some people get rich really fast because they produce a lot. They create a lot. Other people get rich slower because they produce less. But everybody gets richer. Everybody. At least everybody who's willing to work who's willing to be productive, at whatever level they are. Capitalism worked here in England in the 19th century, and it's sad to me that your study of 19th century is so distorted that most people don't see the magnificence of the Industrial Revolution. Capitalism worked in a barbaric and primitive and poor place like America that you guys abandoned, wouldn't even fight a war to really keep it because it was so pathetic and let the Americans win. And it worked. Capitalism worked 
today, over the last 30 years, 1.1 billion people have come out of extreme poverty. 1.1 billion. Now we should be celebrating in the streets. We should be partying. This is the best news in all of human history. That number of people have come out of extreme poverty. But we don't. Because what brought them out of extreme poverty? Foreign aid? No. Charity? Maybe Bill Gates did it. It was charity. No. Who brought them out of extreme poverty? A little bit of capitalism. A little bit of capitalism in China. A little bit of capitalism in India. Even a little bit, a little bit of economic freedom in Vietnam and Asia has come out of poverty. Even if you go to Africa today in Rwanda, Botswana, you see a little bit of capitalism starting to bring Africa out of poverty. Capitalism is the only system to bring anybody out of poverty in human history. But more importantly, and I've got less than a minute, capitalism is the only moral system. And the reason it's a moral system is because it leaves you, the individual, free to pursue your life, your thoughts, your ideas, your happiness. You as an individual, without being sacrificed to anybody. And indeed, if you want to be a socialist under capitalism, you can do it. You can take your friends, you can start a commune, you can take from each according to his ability and give to each according to his needs, and you can live the miserable life that that leads to. And if you don't believe me it's miserable, go and study the kibbutz in Israel, and you'll discover how miserable communism actually leads to, in fact, in reality, even when it's voluntary. So morality and reality dictate that capitalism is far superior to socialism. Thank you. So okay, thank you, thank you for everybody for coming to this debate, which I think is going to be very interesting. I'm very excited for it. Um, thank you for the team for inviting me to speak in favour of socialism. And thank you, Yaron, for giving us what is, I, suppose, I would say, the kind of the case for the status quo. And one thing I find particularly exciting that we're having this debate now is that, in one, in one sense, Yaron's right that about 25 years ago, basically at the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union, that's precisely what the world population was told: socialism has failed. It's over. Capitalism has won. And yet, we are still having this debate. And in America, a recent Gallup poll showed that 51% of people under the age, between the age of 18 and 29, 51% preferred socialism to capitalism. In the United States of America, in the belly of the beast, where for decades people have been told precisely the same arguments that we've just heard now. The arguments are falling on deaf ears. Why is that? Is that because a generation of Americans just are deaf or stupid? No, it's because their own living experience is telling them something different. That millions upon millions of people have, are having an increasingly profound sense that something is not right. That the system in which we live, a capitalist system, and it, uh, frankly it doesn't matter what your definition is, this is a capitalist system we live under, is not working and an alternative is necessary. So in the limited amount of time I have, I want to talk about what is capitalism, why is it working, and why do I think that socialism is the alternative. Now, one part of the definition of capitalism that Jan gave, which I, I agree with, which I'd like to continue with, is the private ownership of the means of production, distribution, and exchange. I think that's incontrovertible. So what we're talking about, the farms, the factories, the businesses where wealth is produced are privately owned in the main. Obviously, under capitalism, the state does actually intervene a great deal, but we can get onto that. But under this private ownership system, Production takes place under the ownership of a, a single person or a company with uh, private shareholders, and of course, private is an uh, profit. Sorry, is then appropriated privately. However, there's a very interesting contradiction at the heart of the system because ownership may be private, but production isn't. Production under capitalism is more social than under, at any other point in human history. This vision of someone spinning a loom in their own uh, workshop and taking their produce to market and selling it and taking the surplus entirely theirs, you know, the fruit of their own loom, the fruit of their own labor. That's back from the Middle Ages, if not earlier. Capitalist production is uniting an army of workers in, let's say, a factory, for example. The whole basis of capitalist production, not a single commodity produced under capitalism, comes out of the factory system or comes out of production without having been handled and designed and you know, produced by thousands upon thousands of people. It's a social system in that respect. However, production may be social, but appropriation profit is private. And that, that causes certain contradictions and problems in the workings of the system, as we can see. Now, that's justified 
on kind of moral and legal grounds, because apparently the workers and the boss enter into a voluntary legal agreement. The worker says, yes, I'm going to work for you, and then, you know, you pay me and, and you can keep it. But it's not quite how that works, is it? It's not an equal partnership where the worker is paid the value that they produce, that they've contributed to the good. If they were, there would be no profit and there would be no capitalism. Instead, actually, the worker is paid for their value as a worker. Their value as a worker is basically what it keeps them, what it pays to keep them a worker. So that's the means of subsistence. What they need to live, what their shelter, their food, the training they're required, that they're required is required for, to make them a worker in that given industry. And that is much, much less than the total value that they produce through their labour. And what's then taken, appropriated by the capitalists, is precisely that. And that is the source of all profit. That is why it's not incorrect to say that the source of all profit is the unpaid labour of the workers. I can give you an example from my own life, actually. In a previous life, before I did this full time, I was a lawyer. Now, I don't want to get into a debate about whether what lawyers do is valuable or not. But at my desk, at my computer, I had a little clock. And this little clock didn't tell me what time it was. This clock told me how much time I'd bill. That's how lawyers make money. They bill time and then and send it to their clients. And so I could, I could see how much time I'd bill. But importantly, it also gave me a little calculator that told me the value of the time I'd bill, the value of the time that the firm was charging on my behalf, my hourly rate, but I also know my salary, don't I? So I knew from having done the work and seen this clock that the firm was charging on my behalf through my labour four times as much as my monthly salary. And you know, I'd agreed my salary. And that is precisely that difference where the firm's not just my labour, obviously all the employees, is where the overheads are coming from and ultimately the profits of the business can grow. That is the, the entire basis of the capitalist system. And so what flows from that? What flows from that is that you have the constant creation of a gigantic working class, and we, there's time in the rebuttals to come back to this question of poverty, uh, poverty creation or poverty uh, reduction. That's an interesting debate, but I don't have time to come back to that now. What that creates is a system in which the profit drive means that wages must be constantly dampened and hours must be constantly extended because that's precisely where profit comes from. The proof, the proof is in Britain today. Workers in Britain today have seen the longest period or the lowest period of wage growth since the Napoleonic Wars. It's a bit of 19th century British history. When was that? It was the beginning of the 19th century. At the same time, the lame is uh, actually, but that's by the by. Um, lowest period of wage growth since the beginning of the 19th century. Workers are working longer hours since certainly the, uh, the kind of the 1970s, 1980s, and surveys are reporting they're feeling more stressed, more put under, um, under the, the cost of work. And the reason for that is to try and squeeze as much profit out of them as possible. Why? Because the bosses are not investing in time-saving machinery. They're not actually developing the means of production, to put it in Marxist terms, which is the only justification of the role of the capitalist class in the first place. To make matters worse, capital is an absurdity to, to, to um, cherry-pick individual countries and say, this is a capitalist country, this is a socialist country, third country. We live in a global capitalist system. Capitalism, by its very nature, is international. In order for any capitalist class to succeed, and to make profit, it has to venture outside its own borders. It has to find more cheap labour. It has to find resources. It has to, crucially, it has to find markets. And what that also means is that the spread of capitalism was accompanied by the greatest wave of robbery, of destruction, of enslavement and death in the whole of human history. At the same time that the British Golden Age was going on, the Golden Age of laissez-faire capitalism, British armies were literally burning down African cities. Look up Benin City. Look it up. This is a fairy tale. An entire civilization was literally burned to the ground because under the doctrine of terra nullius, the imperialist powers of Europe had decided it's okay, we can found our colonies if nobody's there. And if somebody's there, we'll just make sure nobody's there. And that's how they made that profit in that case, the, the colonization of India. Now, how were, I think that Yara mentioned that if anyone's willing to work, they can get rich. Well, how did people, how many people made willing to work on a capitalist basis? They were forced to make basis. I have mentioned India, but I'll go back to Africa. King Leopold of Belgium in the Congo. How, how did he make the workers want to work? He cut off their hands if they refused. And he enslaved them and forced them to work on his railways. And that made a lot of money for Belgium and capitalist Europe at that time. This is the real morality of the capitalist system. Although, frankly, I don't think this is a moral question. Slavery was moral. Feudalism was moral at the time. And there'll be people today who say that the state is quote moral. That's frankly a distraction from the real question, which is what is going on here today? What is going on with the world? And what is going on with the world is that the system's reached its limit. Regardless of whether you think it's moral or not, it has reached its limit. We can see this in monopoly. One of the fascinating things I find about free competition of the capitalism, and a good, an important aspect of capitalism is free competition, is it not? The free market? It inevitably turns into its opposite. 
it turns into monopoly. We've had deregulated free markets, certainly in the kind of so-called neoliberal period, for quite some time now, decades in fact. And actually, capitalism as a market competitive system has existed for centuries. And we have now a situation where 10 companies, 10 multinationals, own almost all of the food and drink brands that you're ever going to encounter. How's that for consumer choice? The five media brands own 90% of market share in the United States. Five companies basically get to tell you what to think. And you have a handful, literally a handful of banks that are considered so too big to fail, so big that when they managed to collapse, the state had to come in and bail out. Now, regardless of whether you think that that was the correct choice for the government to do, whether that was moral, the reason it stepped in is because it didn't. If uh, Fannie and Freddie weren't bailed out, then banks were refusing to lend without government underwriting. In other words, basically the entire economy would collapse. The economy, the entire economy was held ransom by a handful of companies. Companies which, incidentally, their executives have a direct line to the White House. This is what we saw in 2008. Goldman Sachs basically got to ring up Barack Obama and said, you better sort this out. Do we get that? I mean, clearly I'm not an American citizen, but do all the American citizens get that? I don't think so. Is that democracy that you can vote for whichever government you want, as long as it does what the banks want it to do? Another issue is you, we can see this dead end physically in the environment. That everybody knows you need to tackle deforestation, you need to tackle emissions, and what's going on? That you have 100 companies that are responsible for 70% of all um, industrial emissions, and the world seems incapable of dealing with it. Now, I have a very short time, unfortunately, but what is the alternative to all this? Darren already, already mentioned it. Collective ownership and control of the means of production, distribution, exchange. What does that mean? It's not just nationalisation. It's not just government doing stuff. We have to take the means of production out of the hands of these monopolists, of course. Otherwise, how are you going to have it in the first place? But then what do you do with it? It requires a complete, thoroughgoing democratisation, not only of our politics, but of our economics. What I'm talking about is the workplaces, the neighbourhoods and the schools all having a say, dictating the priorities of what we produce, by whom, for whom, which currently is all dictated by, uh, by CAOs and boards of directors. Why? Why? Uh, uh, one last statistic. Actually, this practice economy is already planned. Don't be scared of a planned economy. We live under one. 80% of world trade is global value chains through multinational corporations. They're planning it themselves. But why do they plan it? They plan it for their own benefit, for profit. The difference with a socialist plan will be a socialist plan by society, by the human race entirely, to dictate its own priorities on production. We have the means to do this, we have the technology to do this, it's entirely possible. The only obstacle in the way, in the way is the capitalist system itself. And so I think, to finish, that we do have a choice here. Well, that's why I'm, I'm really pleased that this debate has been put on in the first place, and I congratulate people for putting this on. Because we do have a choice. We have a choice between a system which is, is actively destroying the planet, or a better alternative and a better future. We have a choice, I would say, not between capitalism and socialism in that sense, but between socialism and barbarism. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, to both speakers. We're now going to go to the rebuttal uh, stage. Each speaker gets five minutes to reply to some of the uh, things that they've heard, and then we'll move into the discussion and then over to you. So five minutes apiece. So that's the first time I've ever been accused of defending the status quo. Um, <laughs> the idea that we live in a capitalist world is absurd. A little bit of capitalism, lots of socialism. Last I saw, a big chunk of GDP of every single country in the West certainly is devoted to redistribution of wealth. Bailouts. Bailouts are not exactly capitalism. They are central plan authoritarian dictates that take from some and give to others. The financial system or any system out there is massively regulated. Now, let's, I mean, you laugh, but you, you admitted that capitalism is a system of private property. What does it mean to own your own property? It means you get to decide what to do with it. You, you might like it or not, but I get to decide what to do with my property, when to sell it, who to sell it to, how much to pay employees on it, how much not to pay. But that's not true. In the United States, the government tells me how much I have to pay my workers. The government tells me what buildings I can build on my land. The government tells me what kind of products I can issue and what not, how much leverage I can take on or not if I'm a bank. The idea that we live in some capitalist economy out there. No, there, there's a ton of problems in the world today, including the lack of rising wages, the lack of investment in productivity, 
which would exist under capitalism and doesn't exist partially because we tax away the capital that would have gone to that and partially because it's overly, it's overly, it's regulated to the extent that people don't invest in the means to increase production or productivity of labor. So we might be debating, we, we are debating capitalism as a socialism, but let's not be under any illusion. We do not live in a capitalist society. We live in a statist society. We live in a society in which governments control those multi-million corporations that tell them what they can export and what they can import, what they can produce and what they can't produce, and what they can pay their employees. I mean, maybe this is closer to a fascist economy where we pretend we have private property, but that private property is controlled by the people who really pull the strings in our governments. But to the extent that private property is respected, to that extent we thrive, to the extent that it's denied through regulations, through controls, through redistribution, to that extent we suffer. So I'm not here to defend the status quo. I'm here to defend an ideal vision of capitalism where all property is privately owned and where the government has no say, none, zero in how I use my property unless I'm somehow harming physically my neighbor. That is what capitalism is about. Cool. <laughs> she didn't like that, sorry. <laughs> she or he. I just want to make one other point, because everything you said we disagree, and I'm sure it's the same in the other way around, so I want to make one other point. This idea that labor is exploited is one of the most bizarre ideas in human history. And Marx, man, what a... Um, <laughs> there is no labor. There is no such thing as labor until they are capitalists, until they are entrepreneurs. Labor is basically a subsistence farmer until somebody has an idea for an iPhone, somebody has an idea for a steam engine. The idea is worth gazillions more than the manual labor it takes to actually build the thing. The manual labor that actually gets to build whatever it is, is, you know, a dime a dozen. That's why it's so cheap. The ideas, the ability to organize a factory, the ability to organize a business, the idea to organize marketing and legal and all this stuff, that is unbelievably rare. To become a CEO of a successful company, in Silicon Valley, in Wall Street, or anywhere else, is a massive achievement of brilliance. These people deserve every last dime they get because indeed, they create more wealth than they ever get themselves in our hands. I mean, this iPhone, this iPhone won't exist without Steve Jobs. It doesn't exist without somebody having the vision and the ability to coordinate those supply chains that you take for granted, yeah, there's a supply chain. You know how complicated a supply chain is? Do you even know what a supply chain is and how it works and what logistics have to go into it and the achievement that something like Amazon, the richest man in the world right now, the achievement of what that took and the kind of ideas, the kind of thinking, the kind of effort. I mean, that wealth, the, the amount of creation created by the people at that you call exploiters far exceeds the amount of actual creation created by all the manual labors in the entire world. Wow. Thank you. Okay, so capitalism isn't capitalism. I think we've got to be serious here. What are these categories that we use? Are they just labels that we can stick on things we like or don't like? Or are we trying to seriously get to the bottom of this problem? You can't simply say that everything that's good in the world and works is capitalism, everything that's bad and doesn't work is socialism. It's meaningless and arbitrary. For example, to say like Venezuela, where two-thirds of the economy in the private sector, you know where I saw that Fox News, not a big fan of the Bolivarian government, two-thirds of the economy are dominated by the private sector, say that's all socialism, that's all terrible. And then in China, where the public sector still dominates, 55% of assets in the Chinese economy are dominated by state banks and state-owned enterprises. That's a success story for capitalism. Let's just sort out what we mean by these terms, 
and then argue that accordingly. I think I've been relatively clear on where I stand on that. And I think if you look at the current system in which we live, which is a social system which has evolved over not just 200 years, but many hundred years, which is a capitalist system based on the exploitation of the working class, which has not existed before in history. Exploitation has. Slavery certainly has existed. I'm not suggesting that capitalism invented exploitation, not at all. It refined it, on a, you might say, on a more civilised basis. But exploitation still exists. Now let's talk billionaires, let's talk capitalists. Who were the first capitalists? First capitalists were not visionaries who in, uh, invented new machines. People did invent new machines as part of the development of capitalism. The first capitalists were landowners, often feudal lords, who basically started employing people on their land as labourers to produce things like wheat, who would they, which they would then sell on the market, the market that was developing already. Later, what were the first industries in England? We're talking about history, who knows the history? What were the first industries in England? Wool, and then cotton. Now, are we seriously suggesting that the British capitalists invented wool and cotton? I don't think so. I think both of those things would be produced for thousands of years between, before the British capitalists got their hands on What they did do was they revolutionised production, which I accept. I accept as a socialist that the capitalists revolutionised production. They didn't have the idea of producing this. What they succeeded in doing, because of the concentration of wealth that occurred even before, is they had the means of throwing in workshops uh, workers together in the kind of situation that I already described. That is the basis of capitalist production. That's the revolution that it wrought in society. It was one of social relations. It wasn't simply people having amazing ideas. And let's face it, okay, for an iPhone to get made, it needs someone to come up with the idea for an iPhone. Okay, it also needs people to make it. And most of the people who design these products, most of the people who monitor the global supply chain, and every single person who puts those phones together, are workers. They're paid employees who get paid a wage for their work. So it all comes that the basis of the capitalist system still asserts itself time and time again. That is the key point in all this. And to come back on another point was made, every time that capitalism has been tried, it succeeded. That is not true. Now, regardless of what you think of the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union did collapse. So you can, I think we can conclude the Soviet Union failed, did collapse. Following the Soviet Union, you had a rapid privatization of drive to turn it into a capitalist economy. And this was putting it in private hands. This was fulfilling Yarn's definition of what capitalism is. And it wasn't just a little bit of capitalism. It turned out to be, well, call it shock therapy. I think you can probably interpret what was meant by that. The end result, according to a study in Europe, published in The Lancet, is that the Russian population declined by 7 million people. And the majority of that was not people emigrating, it was people dying earlier. The average life expectancy of a male Russian worker in Moscow dropped to about 54 years old. It dropped about 19 years as a result of the introduction of capitalism. The Russian economy collapsed to so to much the extent, the ruble collapsed, even more to the extent you see in Zimbabwe today or Venezuela, people were bartering with bottles of vodka because there was no currency to use. Ma the Mafia took control of entire cities. And what do we see now? Would we describe Russia as a democratic beacon for the capitalist world? I don't think so. I think it's a fantastic example of how capitalism is incapable of moving society forward. Didn't have the opportunity to talk much about Venezuela. As you've already heard, I don't consider Venezuela to be an example of socialism, where the vast majority of the economy is dominated by the private sector. What Venezuela demonstrates is it's impossible to try and apply socialist policies, to try and give people free education, free healthcare, um, give them minimum wage, cap rents. Those are the kind of policies they were trying to do. It's impossible to achieve that sustainably on the basis of a capitalist economy, because the market will rebel. That is what happens. So that all that shows is that you can't build socialism under capitalism. Agreed. We have a point of agreement. That's excellent. The point is, which would you prefer? And I, I've already made my case that I think socialism is literally the only way forward. I think looking towards an ideal picture of capitalism, when we've had literally 500 years of the development of capitalism, is much more absurd than trying to work towards a socialist future, when the capitalist world is actually falling apart around our ears. I haven't even had time to talk about the question of the world crisis. Maybe we'll also come, up, come back to it. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. We'll just go into uh, some discussion before Q&A. Um, and it strikes me at least that on the one hand, Josh is saying many of the states we associate with socialism aren't actually socialist. And on the other hand, you're already making the case that capitalism as you would like to see it isn't currently in existence. But if you each have to choose one state, one society that comes as close closer than others to your ideal destination, what would it be? 
today or in history? Right now. Right now. This is the advantage of being in chat. <laughs> I mean, I think that it's, it's a really difficult question to answer because we live in what I would call a mixed, a mixed economy world, a world in which there are elements of capitalism, there's some private property, but that private property is heavily controlled by the authorities. And maybe 20 years ago, I would have said Hong Kong, but given China's takeover of Hong Kong, political takeover of Hong Kong, I hesitate because what a horrible place China is turning Hong Kong into by uh, bringing in its collectivization, its collective, uh, you know, attitudes uh, and, and the, the inability to speak freely. Uh, the places, a lot of places that are relatively, relatively speaking, economically free are socially unfree, like Singapore. So I hesitate to even mention Singapore because I don't support the, 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 the socialism there. So, so it's hard. So if I had a pick, right, so I, 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 I'm, I've got my head the economic freedom index, right? So number one and number two, we've crossed out for for, for two weeks for China and, and social freedom. I think number three is uh, New Zealand, which I happen to love because it's the most beautiful place on the planet. And I think number three, number four, number five are New Zealand, Switzerland, and Ireland. And number six is the United States. And the United, so I would say New Zealand, uh, Switzerland, Ireland would be my top three that I would choose where you get a good balance of both social freedoms and quite a bit of economic freedom at the same time. Okay, that's and, and now that Ireland has passed a law allowing for abortion, I'm good with that too. Okay, three for the price of more, uh, one. Josh, what about you? Well, look, as I already mentioned, First of all, capitalism is itself a global system. So identifying specific countries and saying that is a vision of, of the society we want to see is, is, I don't think it works as a method. I'm going to try and answer the question, don't I? And that, that applies all the more for socialism. The whole basis of at least my vision of socialism, most of the socialists I've spoken to, is that socialism is international or is nothing. That it requires the international cooperation of workers and nations everywhere. And otherwise, it is simply not going to work. So picking a socialist nation, which often, the kind of socialist revolutions that have taken place, have taken place in formerly colonial subjects, colonially subjugated countries, which have tried to liberate themselves, in order to do that, have then expropriated the, the, the you know, factories from often foreign-owned companies, or the mines and so on, and then have had to try and find their own way. Often those regimes have degenerated. Some of them have degenerated extremely quickly, and so would hardly conform to an ideal picture of society, perhaps in anyone's mind. Although one thing they have done sometimes, uh, often, is they've actually been able to develop the economy, develop literacy and things like that. Often at quite a big cost though. But in terms of talking about specific countries, one which currently still, still exists, which is trying to move in a socialist direction. I don't think it's there yet. I don't think socialism has ever built, been built anywhere, incidentally. And many of the people who try to build socialism, people like Lenin and Trotsky, explicitly said, this is what we're trying to build, this is not what we have succeeded in building. But in terms of a, a case study for a country, with those caveats, and I will hope you take those into, into consideration, I, I would like to talk about Cuba. Because Cuba is a tiny island with an even smaller economy, basically a tourist and tin economy, and production of sugar at one point, off the, just off the coast of the greatest superpower, economic and military, that has ever, ever existed in world history. Not the best place to really start building socialism, to be honest. They had a, a revolution in order, in terms of like Castro and his movement, their, the purpose of their revolution was for democratic independence. It was a nationalist revolution to kick out foreign um, intervention politically, to kick out a dictator, incidentally, uh, Batista, who, once he'd gone, he didn't take all of the foreign American Canadian intervention with him. And so, inevitably, in order to basically defend the revolution itself, they started nationalizing and planning the economy, which I think was a, a step forward. It's not the end point, it's not they haven't reached socialism simply by nationalizing the economy. And what flowed from that is first of all the increase in literacy for the entire Cuban population, which was uh, which was at a very low level even for the region at that time, so basically 100 percent the creation of the best healthcare system in the region. One in which rich Americans will even travel to Cuba to have their um, operations, which frankly is miraculous as far as I'm concerned. Free education, up to and including university education, which is better than here, which is quite embarrassing considering how rich the United Kingdom is. And a political um, uh, regime, which definitely has its problems. And actually, I would say the whole of Cuban society has its problems that needs to be solved. And I would not consider Cuba to be a workers' democracy. 
But I think we could probably all agree that it was a lot healthier than other um, regimes that attempted, attempted to go in the same direction, such as North Korea. So I would say that is a good example of what can be achieved on a very limited basis. So just think about what we could achieve on a global basis. Okay, well, we have uh, breeding week coming up, so you can choose between Cuba or New Zealand, uh, depending on where you want to go. Really? Uh, <laughs> do you want I mean, to nobody has swam out into the ocean in New Zealand to find freedom, but they certainly have from Cuba. All you have to do is look at population flows, and you can tell which is a, which is a good country and which is a bad one. Uh, just ask you both. Uh, uh, I'm going to ask you each a difficult question. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, Josh. I'll leave you to ponder this because you just finished speaking. So the question I wanted to ask you is: Why are socialist parties and social democratic parties, despite everything you've said, doing so poorly at this point in time? But the question I want to ask, Yaron, is: Despite everything you've said. Why um, are we seeing some of the stats that Josh cited about young people's support for socialism, strong support for Jeremy Corbyn in the UK, strong support for um, sort of similar uh, you know, for Demos in Spain and others? What's going wrong there from your perspective in terms of capitalism's inability to, to win over those voters? Yeah, let me be clear, I'm losing. Not right now, right here necessarily, but in the world out there, my argument is losing because uh, capitalism is in decline and capitalism is fading. Capitalism is in crisis, if you want to call it, and the, the, the voices of, of, of socialism and social democracy are increasing and they're much more popular than I am, much more popular. If Noam Chomsky were here, we'd have, you know, the auditorium would be, would be filled. Right, or, or many socialists were here. So, so that is the key question. And I, I don't have a time to give the complete answer, but I, I just want to mention two things that I think are crucial here. One is that the socialist side has been very good at attributing every single problem in the world today to capitalism. Uh, it, it, at least in America, it started with the progressives uh, blaming every problem that happened in the 19th century, and then the big one, the Great Depression on capitalism. No economist in the world, or no, no, a majority of economists in the world, overwhelming majority of economists, don't believe that free markets caused the Great Depression anymore. But for decades, that's what they believed. Indeed, right now, most people think, including I assume a majority of the audience, think that the 2008 crisis was caused by capitalism, by bankers, by greedy bankers, which is a myth and wrong for right. I've given an eight hour course on the Great, on, on the great Recession and what caused it. So I'm not going to try to recreate it here. It was caused by government policies and central planning and bad incentives and all of that. But, but you know, in 10 years, most economists will agree with me. I have no doubt about that. But in the meantime, the story that it was caused by free markets is one that, that permeates society. And the same thing about the Great Depression. You still learn in your school books that the Great Depression was caused by speculation in the stock market. Again, no economist actually believes that anymore. But it takes a while for these things to, to change. But that just begs the question, in a sense. Why does the other side get away with telling these blatant lies and it, it's not corrected and it keeps sustaining itself? I think because there's one thing about capitalism that is so revolutionary that we're not ready for it. And that is the exact moral argument that we were discussing. Socialism is built on a 2,000 year old morality, and some of you might think you're on my side will find this objectionable, but it's the fact. I think socialism is just an extension of Christianity. Socialism is built on the idea that the fundamental purpose of an individual's life is to serve others. That the fundamental moral code is a code of altruism. That is a service to others, sacrifice, selflessness is what's good, what's noble, what's right, what's just. And we all accept that. Culture has accepted that for 2,000 years and has been unchallenged, except by, I think, two philosophers, maybe Spinoza and certainly Ayn Rand, but almost nobody else. Aristotle originally, but he came before Christianity. And 
So the idea that you as an individual, your happiness as a goal, as an end, as a purpose in life, as a moral purpose in life, is just not being accepted by society. And yet, what is capitalism? And this might play into the other side's hands, but what is capitalism? Capitalism is a system of self-interest. Capitalism is a system of individuals suing their self-interest, whether they put that on the production side, the consumption side, the employee side, in every direction. It's about individuals pursuing their self-interest. And we think self-interest is nasty. We think self-interest is immoral. We think self-interest is bad. My mother taught me from when I was this little, be selfless. Don't be selfish, selfish, oh, that's evil. But the fact is, my life's fine. I care about myself more than I care about you guys. I save my kids if they're drowning before I save the neighbor's kids if they're drowning. My life is more precious to me than yours. My system of values is about my happiness, my success. And I don't think that it entails, I know it doesn't entail you being worse off, but it entails me focusing on my life and on my values and on my happiness. Now that is much more controversial than capitalism, much more questioning the foundational beliefs that we have in our culture. Because socialism is built, again, on everything's collective. Everything is you. Everything is about you. Not about me. Not about my happiness. Not about my success. Not about my prosperity. It's irrelevant. And this is why, this is why, when massive people die under socialism, it's no big deal. It's no big deal. And again, my point is not that socialism can be tried perfectly. I think communism got there pretty, you know, got pretty far. And not that capitalism is being tried perfectly, but again, to the extent that the system's tried, it fails. And we can talk about Russia if you allow us at some point. So the question uh, to Josh is why are socialist parties, social democratic parties too, doing so poorly at this moment in history, you look across Europe, Historic lows in many countries, UK something of, a, of an outlier. What's going on there? And use that as a platform to perhaps elaborate as, uh, as your, your rival did. Sure. Well, when we look at political parties, obviously they don't exist entirely in the abstract and they have their own history and they have a link to whichever people they represent, whichever people vote for them. And if you look at the history of social democracy, over, let's say the last hundred years, that's a pretty good. Uh, region. What you see is with the history of capitalism, and we are talking about the history of the capitalist system, um, you see social democratic parties time and time again adapting to themselves to that. In fact, actually the irony, the great irony of social democracy and the decline of the social socialist parties is precisely the extent to which they have embraced capitalism, they have declined. So if we look at, in more recent times, let's look at the Labour Party. So the history of the Labour Party in the last 30 years is fascinating, because as you correctly say, there's a little bit of an exception to this rule today. But prior to that, I wouldn't necessarily say so. The, the Labour Party in 1918, under the influence of the Bolshevik Revolution, included in clause 4, part 4 of its constitution, a commitment to the collective ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange. That's a commitment to socialism. In 1994, that was taken away and removed by Tony Blair and the leadership of the Labour Party, with a commitment to a market economy, a rigorous market economy, or vigorous economy, unfortunately, but certainly to a market system. In other words, it made an explicit commitment to capitalism. And you can see that in the policies that it pursued as well. When it came into government, it pursued pretty much identical policies to what you could probably have expected the Tory party to carry out, but with some certain differences. I will give them that. I mean, they, they deregulated bank, the banking sector, which the Tories would have certainly done as well. They, of course, went to war with Iraq, with the, the supporting America, and I would consider that an imperialist war, to defend their capitalist uh, interests. And again, I think that's completely linked to capitalism. The idea that all these things like war and imperialism are just kind of an aberration is really just trying to avoid the entire question. In the same way we talk about individual interests and sacrifice, Surely, the main sacrifice of capitalism, uh, capitalism is a system that has demanded sacrifice, for, uh, apologies, but the sacrifice of millions of people often forced. That doesn't seem to me to be that interested in individual interest. Um, it seems more to be interested in the interest of a, a handful of, of capitalists. And the Labour Party accommodated, accommodated itself to that, and it suffered as a result. 
Because, of course, if, you, if your party is founded on things like the trade unions, if your party is founded essentially on the workers and socialist movement, but then having been brought to power or brought to the cusp of power on the basis of that movement, you then basically start carrying out austerity, carrying out cuts, deregulating the banks, carrying out policies that are very supportive of capitalism and the capitalist system, then if that system is doing well, if that system you know, is growing and people can keep their head down and, and make better wages, their lives improve, then they'll leave them to it. That's why you saw actually emptying out of all political parties in the period of the last boom, because people thought, well, let the politicians get on with politics. Things are going okay for us. When the crisis hits, and we, regardless of the cause of the crisis, we can accept that capitalism is a crisis within the system. We've seen it many, many times. When the crisis hits again, and you're the ones in the driving seat, and you're the ones who bail out the banks and then have to uh, compensate uh, the state by taking out the taxpayer, basically, in the working class, by pushing through cuts. And when in opposition, you are totally incapable of putting forward any kind of alternative to the right wing governments carrying out cuts. I don't think it's even remotely um, uh, surprising that people who voted for you, or, or working class people and people in the trade unions and so on, would turn their backs on you. What's fascinating about what's going on in Europe is every, uh, in every single country, in France with the Socialist Party, and incidentally, it's not just in the left, it's also all the establishment parties are suffering. In France, the Republicans uh, used to be the UMP, the Old de Gaulle's party. They suffered greatly as well. You have a complete turnaround in the political sphere in France. In Greece, the old Socialist Party, which had a great deal of kind of yeah, a tradition and a great deal of support because it played a big role in the revolution in the 80s, it carried out vicious austerity, it was liquidated. I think it maybe still exists, but it's getting less than 5%. This used to be a mass party. Syriza, which was nothing, it was basically a collection of left-wing sects, became the biggest mass left-wing party in Europe at that time. What well, it do, it came government, they said, we're not going to carry out austerity, we're a socialist party, we're going to say no to the EU. They said, they said, oh, can we try and do something different? The EU said, no. And then they just carried out 8 billion euros worth of cuts. So no wonder that their support is now falling. And it's looking like the new democracy, which is the equivalent of the Tories really in Greece, are going to come back in. That's why social democracy is suffering. That's why, because they're incapable of posing any kind of alternative to the capitalist crisis. And what's interesting, and this affects the right as much as the left, actually, where political parties and politicians are saying, this, what we currently have, the status quo, is not working. This is how we are going to solve it. This is how we are going to bring jobs back. This is how we are going to develop the economy. This is how we're going to make your life better and actually compose an alternative. Then they do better. And we're seeing that on the left. The reason that so many people are turning to Jeremy Corbyn is after decades, and I speak because I was born in 1989, and I, no, I kind of became more political, politically conscious when the Labour Party was in government, the Blair government. And so I can say in my lifetime, he is certainly the most left-wing uh, Labour leader in my lifetime, probably in the history of the Labour Party, probably, in some, in some respects. And he's the first person I have ever seen actually trying to pose some kind of alternative to this crisis. That's precisely why he's popular, and that's precisely why the Conservative Democratic Party is a failing in my opinion. Mm. Well, thank you very much. There's a, a word that I want to throw out there that, that neither of you have mentioned so far, and I think it's a word that uh, takes us into um, thinking about some of the challenges that are facing uh, uh, capitalism, and we talked about individualism. <laughs> nature of humankind and also what I think is a big challenge facing socialism and that's nationalism and where does nationalism sit now as a challenge to both of your ideas when I look at Europe I see actually a lot of parties that are not offering individualist appeals but are predominantly collective tribal movements that seem to have momentum. And when I look at the voters that are leaving socialist parties and some of these movements that are now more working class than many socialist uh, parties in relative terms, when you look at their electorate, they're going to national populist parties or they're just giving up on politics altogether. So could you just offer some reflections on where you see nationalism fitting in, because when I look at surveys and I see 85, 90% of people even today saying, I would fight for my nation if there was a war tomorrow. I don't see much appetite for a sort of internationalist, borderless, capitalist or socialist world yet. Maybe some reflections. 
Yeah, so I think nationalism is the real alternative out there to the crisis that we face. And we agree that there's a crisis today. I mean, I'm a little jealous of the socialists in this sense. You guys at least have politicians who claim to be socialists. You actually have politician political parties called the socialist parties. Uh, we capitalists are pretty lonely. Uh, there are no politicians who represent us. And I know you're trying to redefine capitalism to represent the status quo, but that's cheating because you acknowledge that it was the system of private property and we have no private property, not in the full sense of the word today. So we don't have anybody. There's nobody out there on the political spectrum today arguing for what I consider capitalism, which is the separation of state from economics. That to me is capitalism. When the state has no, no role in the economy. And then economically, we do what we want. And I think nationalism is what people are emotionally attracted to as a solution to the crisis that exists today. Because clearly there's a crisis and there's immense angst out there among people. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a horrific and very dangerous trend. It is anti the individual. It is anti freedom. And it is anti-capitalist. It is a different form of subjugating the individual, not maybe to the proletarian or whatever you want to substitute the proletarian for, for in socialism, but it is the subjugation of the individual to the state, whatever that state happens to be, or to the ethnic group. And, and a lot of the nationalism, unfortunately, also has racist kind of uh, uh, themes to it. It's a subjugation of the individual to the racial group. And I think those are horrific trends. I think it's where the world, unfortunately, is heading right now. I see those movements in Europe, and I see it in the United States with, uh, with Trump and with uh, many who, uh, who are passionate supporters of Trump. I see this inclination. And I, you know, at the end of the day, I stand with individuals. I, I believe that capitalism, while it can thrive within a border, right, I think it thrives much better with open borders and with international trade and with being a globalized system. Uh, and to the extent that we're building walls, to the extent that we're fighting over tariffs, to the extent that we have a concept even of American jobs or a concept of you know, uh, uh, American wealth as if there's something magical about being American. Um, I think that's false. Capitalism is about competition. If competition happens to happen in China, so be it. Let it go. That's great. Um, so I, I think this is probably the, most, the biggest threat to individual liberty and individual freedom, both on the economic side and on the social side uh, that we face today. And my fear, ultimately, is that socialism is the only alternative to that. And we're stuck between two alternatives that are going to destroy the progress that I think has been indeed made over the last 250 years in eradicating poverty and creating the technology we have in the lifestyles, in spite of the crisis, life's pretty good, right? Um, that, 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 that is gonna be crushed by the force of either nationalism or socialism as the two collectivist, anti-individualist perspective. Josh? Yeah, I think it's a really fascinating question. I think that capitalism has a very interesting relationship with nationalism. Because much of what Jan said about competition needing to be international and freedom of movement being an important part of, of capitalism is correct. But at the same time, the evolution of capitalism took place through individual national markets and nation states and the formation of what we consider to be the modern nations, for example, Germany, out of lots of tiny little principalities effectively, or Britain, out of different nationalities, um, was a progressive part of the development of capitalism. But it seemed to kind of run to a halt. And one thing, I, one thing I disagree with Yaron on is that there are politicians who have validly call themselves capitalists and pro-capitalists. I mean, Theresa May in our country oh my God. stood up and said, <laughs> she said, capitalism is the most progressive force of human and you know, collective progress in history. She's defending capitalism. So does Elizabeth Warren in America. I mean, I was about to say, politicians says sorry, something but suggests that... But then, it's, you just said... <laughs> They don't reflect what you want, doesn't make them any less a capitalist, and they're defending the capitalist system. But what they're also forced to do is they're also forced to talk about this kind of common interest. You know, we can talk about collective, but like a common interest between, I don't know, the American boss and the American worker, or the British boss and the British worker, or the white boss and the white worker. That's used in order 
to defend their system ultimately. Because if you have a system where you have a tiny minority who appropriate all wealth, and you have a mass of workers, or unemployed, or in some cases, peasants still working, working the land, depending on the country, who, especially in crisis times, are seeing things get worse, and the vast majority of people in Britain and America are seeing things get worse as a result of the crisis, which is reflected in the kind of opinion polls we're talking about, then you have to be able to feed them something. In fact, Martin Luther King talking about the, the kind of the poor whites, he says that the poor white has nothing to eat, so he eats Jim Crow. That the Jim Crow laws and the kind of reactionary garbage that politicians would come out with were used in order to divide the workers because they knew. And I thought, I thought something that Yaron said is incredibly insightful, actually. But I think it is actually, uh, I think he's correct that the, the choice we're going to be given is between this kind of nightmarish nationalist barbarism and a socialist alternative. And so I think that for, for me, the, the obvious alternative to that, the, the obvious answer to that is socialism. Because Capitalism, simply in order to sustain itself, is having to divide the workers along these lines. You're having to see this rhetoric, again, speaking as a British person, the rhetoric in Britain has been ramped up. I wonder if, they, you know, the British will only agree. The chauvinism in Britain, not just relating to Brexit, actually, but even before that, even at the time of the Iraq war, talking about, oh yeah, the army going and killing the bad guys and all this kind of stuff. In the media, in politics, in society, in the papers. Look at the Sun, the Daily Mail, all this kind of stuff, this filth that they put out. They do so because they have their own interests. I mean, Rupert Murdoch is himself a capitalist. He's not an anti-capitalist, I'm sure of that. And yet he's one of the biggest proponents of precisely these disgusting ideas. They do. I mean, I, I think Yarn's view of capitalism is much better. I would prefer that's the way of the day put things out. But the reason it's impossible is because precisely in a period of crisis, it's precisely when the biggest threat of the workers actually joining up, including along, across national lines, is that it's highest. And uh, one part of the question that I thought was very interesting is, how do we overcome these national boundaries? Because I think what was said is, is correct, that we are seeing an increase in chauvinism, and workers are being told to look askance at their neighbours, for example, British workers, to look at fellow European workers and so on, as almost like they're in competition with them and they're the enemy. That is happening, I accept that. So how do we overcome it? And I think one thing that we've seen over the last decade, should we say, since the crisis, is we've seen the, the beginnings and the potential for solidarity and struggle. One thing that I found very interesting is at the time of the Egyptian Revolution in 2011, now Egypt is a very different country with a different history to places like Britain and Greece, um, at the time of that revolution, regardless of the fact that I, I don't think we could say it succeeded, people looked at Tapir Square and they looked, first of all, they saw images of Muslims protecting Christians while praying and Christians protecting Muslims by, while praying, which was inspirational. But also, people all over the world were making reference to that movement. In, um, in Madison, Wisconsin, if I get the, the name right, um, I saw people on strike who were occupying the town hall at that time, and they had stitched onto their jackets, fight like an Egyptian. It was also a Bangles reference, but more importantly, they were referencing the Egyptian revolution in America. The Occupy movement was making direct reference to that as well. Later, when Greece erupted, and I told you all about Syriza and how ultimately I, I believe it failed, but workers and activists in England, in France, in Germany, people I was speaking to were absolutely inspired by what was going on and they were trying to learn those lessons and they were trying to digest those and, uh, and, and make, make their own sense of it. And they have been doing it. Believe me, every time one of these movements erupts and then fails or subsides, they do subside, they don't last forever, we've seen this, people are drawing conclusions all over the world. You can see this by the fact that later on, often these movements are on a higher political level. You take the kind of anti-politics ideas of the Occupy movement, which of course subsided, later on the Indianados movement in Spain. When that came back around, it did so in the form of Podemos. Podemos, which had taken direct inspiration from Syriza. People are looking at each other, people are seeing who's got the right way out of this crisis. I think that's enormously progressive, if it, if it can be organized. If we were to organize internationally on a political basis, I think we'd be able to do a lot more to solve this problem. To, uh, come out to you guys now. Uh, I'm going to take questions uh, in just groups so we can make sure uh, people have a say. Uh, if you keep your question quite short or if you'd like to make a comment, let's not turn a comment into a speech if possible, um, just so everybody can get a, get a foot in. So first round of questions, one here, one behind you, and one over here. In the yeah, you just have to uh, say the question quite loudly. Yep. 
uh, Yaron, you talk about like uh, the iPhone being like this innovative resort of capitalism, but we've got to acknowledge that the internet is a resort of DARPA, GPS is a resort of Navistar, microchips are a resort of NASA, Siri is again a resort of DARPA, touchscreen was technology by CIA and NSF um, investment in at the University of Delaware. Like this idea that innovation comes from capitalism is oh, somewhat sorry, okay. redundant. On innovation, chat behind. Um, Yaron, yeah, in the past, you said that the Brexit, Brexit, that the European Union is a growing statistic monster. Uh, is it okay to expand that? And then obviously, for Josh, you had the idea of kind of a global socialism, so could you kind of say, say something in light of that? Global socialism, and just lastly, the chat from the grave. Yeah, all right, uh, so it's Josh. If capitalism has actually reached its limit, and only socialist parties are closing in trying to solve the crisis, how is it that Donald Trump's tax cuts and deregulation of business has led to higher unemployment uh, and higher wages, particularly for minorities, and has led to oppression and capitalism? Do you mean higher employment? You mean <coughs> lower unemployment? Yeah, sorry, yeah, okay. So why, okay. why has Trump's program been successful? If you why has Trump's program been successful? Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. do you want to? Oh, remind me, I'm sorry. So, I, you know, and all of those inventions were useless until somebody with a profit motive put them together and created something actually useful that all of us need. I mean, it, it, it strikes me as amazing that Occupy Wall Street and the people in Egypt were using the latest technology created by greedy entrepreneurs exploiting laborers uh, in order to communicate, in order to tweet, to do all the things that they're doing, and that these revolutions couldn't exist in if not for those entrepreneurs. Uh, Can I come back like that? No, 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 the chat behind. Uh, the EU, a growing statement. Yeah, so the, I mean, there's the certain features of the EU that I love. Uh, free movement of labor, free movement of capital, free movement of goods, I think is fantastic, and I wish the EU had stuck to that. The problem, and you know, and, and, and I, I, I wish more than that, I wish that was global, right? Ultimately, that should be global. But the problem with the EU is they didn't stick to that. On top of that, they loaded up regulation after regulation after regulation, control after control after control, which is a violation of the principle of capitalism because they are trying to control exactly private property. They're trying to manipulate private property, take away the capitalist incentive. And I think in that sense, it is a disaster and it's a growing disaster because the instinct of bureaucracies, the instinct of central planners is to do more and more and more and more and to grow the status manipulation of the system. So if they stuck to those three principles originally, a free movement of labor, goods, and capital, then I would be pro the UK staying in the EU. As it is right now, I think you guys have screwed it up so badly, this Brexit thing, that you are probably better off staying in the EU. Uh, you're screwed either way. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Uh, so we had a question on uh, Trump uh, policies and yeah, uh, about the uh, same question uh, to you, and then we'll come back to the audience. Okay, we'll start with the same question. I mean, with global socialism, where to begin? I suppose what I would begin with is, is on this question that's just been talked about on the EU, which is not an example of global socialism. First of all, in terms of the EU, in terms of the history of the EU, the EU wasn't founded as a free trade bloc. It was founded as a coal and steel cartel between the biggest coal and steel manufacturers in order to join up the different European capitalist nations which had been shattered by the war. Later, it is developed in this direction. But one thing that I, I would want to touch on is in terms of these regulations, now I, I, I'm not necessarily particularly in favour of all the different um, anti competition laws in the European Union. But one thing that's worth pointing out is that the reason they exist is for them to be able to guarantee this level playing field. Now, the reason they want this level playing field is because German production, especially within the European Union market, is, is overwhelmingly dominant, dominant. If they didn't establish a basic level of these by these anti-competitive laws, then weak countries like Greece would be able to use protectionist measures in order to compete with them. The reason I bring this up is not to come necessarily back to anything people have said, it's just I think it's a really interesting and graphic illustration of how capitalism as it really exists and as it actually evolves ends up breaking its own laws. In order to have free market, you have to have protectionism effectively, and vice versa. It's very interesting. But anyway, how that relates to socialism, you're probably wondering, is what, but why does the EU exist? Fundamentally, you know, trying to get right back down to the fundamentals. Why does it even exist? Because as of necessity, and I think actually we all agree on this, capitalism must go beyond the limits of the nation state. Capitalism confined to a single national market, it would actually collapse. It needs to expand. You need to spread. You need freedom of capital, freedom of movement. 
it, it's a necessarily global system, global system. And so Europe is an expression of that, that European markets that have been kind of relatively independent have become lumped together because actually, look, look around the world. The United States is it's a continent or more than a country really, isn't it? Um, Russia, massive country. China, massive country, massive, uh, massive uh, work forces, massive markets. Europe has tried to compete along those lines. But it's also created even deeper contradictions where, ironically, nationalism and resentment towards the EU and the entire European project is actually increasing. Uh, yeah, resentment is increasing rather than decreasing. Now, how would a kind of international socialism overcome those kind of uh, obstacles? Uh, 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 an international socialism is not a competition between national, different national markets and different national co um, capitalists, and it's certainly not the attempt of individual you know, companies or capitalists in one nation to basically exploit the cheaper workforce in another or the cheaper resources, or just to take it by force, as we've seen many times. It is actually a relationship of, of cooperation, cooperative cooperation between the peoples of those individual nations. So you can actually have these states, these supranational states, where the whole point is to raise the level of development of every single country. Because plenty of countries, based on geographical reasons, sometimes based on cultural reasons and economic reasons, have different specialities a lot of the time, have different uh, strong points or weak points. Well, if you actually were to join them together on the basis of a socialist union, then what you could do is, for example, you could use the, uh, to take the example of uh, Russia and Germany, for example, you could have taken the higher level of development in terms of technology, the engineers present, the, the overall uh, higher development of industry and uh, the economy, and taken that technology into a country where it had abundant national and natural resources, it still does, larger workforce, but a lower level of technical and economic development. And you could, have, you could have had abundant food production to help with uh, German industry and the more uh, urban German uh, civilization, if you like, at that time, and also use the benefits of that for Russia. Now, that's a bit more of a, that's an example from at the time of really the Russian Revolution. Obviously, both countries are now full of, uh, well, they're more developed. To use a more modern um, uh, example, what's going on between the uh, so called developed and undeveloped or developing worlds today? The developing world exports net three trillion dollars to the so-called developed world every single year. They are subsidizing us. They are helping us out, which seems to me remarkably unfair considering the conditions that often exist in those regions and the possibility that we have, have had us as a species in a global society to sort out many of those problems. For example, for example, um, climate change is threatening Bangladesh. It's threatening to basically just turn Bangladesh into well into a sea, effectively. Now, this is something that's already beginning to happen. Another country had, uh, had a, a, I suppose, a comparable problem a long time ago, the Netherlands. And they built, they built dikes, they built irrigation, and they used technology to, be, to pump a lot of that water out and managed to stabilize, literally, their country, literally their land. The technology, technology exists on an even better scale today. That could be used, that could be exported there for free and applied to save the lives of millions of people and also raise the level of, de the, of development for the world as a whole. The reason it doesn't happen is because it's not profitable on the capitalism. Well, the socialism, it doesn't matter if it's profitable. We have the technology, we have the means, we have the people to do it. We just need the will. I think the will is there, actually. We just need the system to do it, sorry. Can we come... <laughs> We're going to come back. We'll build the Trump question into the next round. So we've got a question here. Question here. Um, and sorry, there's a chat here. Uh, Okay, no, no. So I, I have a bit of a question regarding this global world view that you, you seem to have. How will you prevent the fact that the, there are different economies with different rates of pay from reaching a global mean that will be unlivable for all, first of all? Why would I, as an English worker, wish to have to deal with competition from countries where the average wage is $3 an hour, when I can only live because of the prices of living in this country on way more? Why would I want that in my future, for my love future?
And we're talking about literally more deaths than in the Nazi Germany, actively direct response to suicide. So, how can you get that? Okay, interpretation of uh, crises and right. everything. So I want to ask Mr. Holroyd uh, to explain to me what in his mind is the difference between crony capitalism and statism on one side and actual capitalism, capitalism the self-help capitalism. And of course, if Dr. Brook doesn't like the answer, he can pitch in. Okay, okay, so we have wages, wages over here, interpreting crises, and then... Yeah, so... so yeah. So wages, I, let me just make a recommendation because I don't have time to give the full economic answer to that. Is the, it's, a, it's a book that was published a long time ago, not far from here, called The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. It gives a really good explanation for that, um, and I recommend reading it. Uh, basically, you're not competing with them. What your set of skills has to do is to be elevated, and we have the capital in this country to elevate your skills levels, and that's exactly what capitalism does. So. The unemployment in America did not increase because of labor in China. Indeed, quite the contrary. Unemployment, the number of people employed in America, has gone up as employment in China has gone up. There are more people working today, actually working today, than ever in all of human history in production. That the amount produced, the quantity of stuff produced in America, the manufacturing, people talk about manufacturing jobs, Actually, American manufacturing is double what it did 30 years ago with half the number of people because it uses robots and computers. So, but, and, and of course, uh, in America, instead of, instead of uh, thinking all your childhood that I'm going to follow my father and becoming a steel worker, instead of that, you go and become a, a programmer of the gaming industry. Gaming industry has like hundreds of thousands of people working in it. So you elevate your skill level, you're more productive, and you, you get that, those wages. So that the simple jobs that you are not going to do anymore move to China. Don't shake your head because it's just, this is exactly reality. This is exactly what's going on. And the fact is in America today, in America today, you have some of the lowest unemployment rates ever in spite of the statism and the capitalism unemployment would be a lot lower. And it, what you have is the creation in the value creation you have Americans producing at a higher level of value creation than the rest of, you know, than let's say China and Asia. Um, what, just, a, just a few words about, uh, about the crisis. You brought a question. Um, look, if we, define, if we define capitalism in terms of property rights, then one of the important characteristics of that has to be that there is a government that protects property rights. There is an entity, and I'm not an anarchist, I believe in a government. I believe that government needs to protect property rights. One of the things that happened in Russia, and the reason it failed, is because they never did that. There was no protection of property rights. This is why it turned into gangster war against war. It was an example of anarchy. For so those of you who claim to be anarcho-capitalists, Russia in the 90s was a good example. Uh, it's an example of anarchy, not of capitalism, because there was no protection of property rights. Now, to me, what defines capitalism is not competition and, you know, corporation stuff. It's the existence of property rights and a mechanism to defend those property rights through a government. And when that doesn't exist in Somalia, in lots of places where there's no socialism, but there isn't capitalism either because there's no definition of property rights and there's no mechanism to protect those property rights. If Russia had flipped it, started with a legal system, started with establishing the institutions that protect property rights, the legal system and the judiciary system necessary for that, then I think the experience of Russia post-communism would have been very different. Anarchy doesn't work. Okay, so, okay uh, I'll come back to the question about Trump because I have fairly missed out before. I think one thing that needs to be borne in mind is that even at the time, many economists were commenting that the idea of cutting taxes at the same time as increasing spending on infrastructure was only going to be a short-termist policy. And in terms of improving conditions for American workers, the increase in unemployment, sorry, increase in employment has not been met with increase in wages that many people would have expected for them. In fact, actually, real wages in the United States have been more or less stagnant and have not increased since the 70s, which is a remarkable statistic and gives the lie to the idea that Trump is suddenly reading the economy. Um, on, in terms of the question on, on Russia, why Russia was a failure, 
The intention with shock therapy was not to get rid of the state. The intention of shock therapy was to introduce and protect property rights. For example, on copyright, they introduced copyright retrospectively. That's a property right. And the state was meant to guard and defend it. And it did. The state in Russia continued to exist. It's just it ripped. It's ripped in run in certain parts of the country because it wasn't capable of doing so. Because of the precisely because of the failure of the introduction of capitalism into Russia. In terms of the uh, the famine of the Holodomor and uh, Holodomor, sorry, that is an example of tyranny. It's also an example of incompetent state planning. I would accept that and a failure. But many famines have been caused in in, in history, yes, by tyranny and also by market failure. What and also by private companies. The colonization of India was not carried out by the British state. The colonization of India was carried out by the East India Company, a company, and I don't mean it's just the name, it was allowed to go off and do what it liked in India. And what it did is it hired mercenaries and it bought off local kings and it started trading and it, it, it did capitalism, if you like. And eventually it succeeded in taking over. The state only took over the operation when it became so enormous and it actually became the company reached the point of collapse, it had to, stay, uh, had to step in to protect property rights and to uh, protect the interests of their capitalists. And what was the result in terms of famines and failures there in India? That in the real number of people killed as a result of the British Raj is unknown because nobody bothered to count. But we do know that in, during the Second World War in about 1943, four million people starved to death in Nepal as a result. In a country, this has always been an abundant country as far as food production is concerned, and there were different Indian provinces, which are called states now, which could have brought the, the food over to, um, to help the people of, uh, of Bengal, sorry, not Nepal, the Bengalis who were starving. And it was not, that was not done. Why? Because it was more profitable to send the food elsewhere. That's exactly what happened in the Irish family, family as well. Wheat, when, when the Irish peasants were starving to death because their pot potato crop failed, wheat was still being exported from Ireland. Ireland was exporting food at the same time their population was dying. Why? Because it was profitable, because of capitalism. And incidentally, the Irish population has never recovered. The Irish population was halved by death and migration, and it's still not the reached the point it was in the middle of the 19th century. I would say that that is just as much a failure of capitalism as it is of anything else in France. Lady at the back, so we go one here, one here, and then we've got the lady with the hand up. Yeah, that's you, you, down the behind you. Yeah, okay. Uh, you, you, they have an answer to my question. The chronic capitalism, I know, yeah. yeah. And we're going to include responses to chronic capitalism. Um, yeah, Josh has already touched on it slightly. Um, I want to ask Yara that question, if you'd like to hear a response. Uh, one of the most fundamental crises today is the issue of climate change, of course. Uh, and a primary motivation of the capitalist class is the increase in profit. Uh, for the most part, a significant shift towards sustainable sustainability seems impossible for the capitalist system because it's not in the interest of profit. So how do you intend capitalism, or even this kind of pure utopian capitalism you keep talking about, how do you intend for it to solve this issue of climate change? Yeah, my question is, um, how can capitalism ever overcome? How can capitalism ever overcome gender politics and so everybody who's not within the binary system of female and male? How can it overcome it by when when access to capitalism is not only restricted by legal methods but also restricted by deep seated and implicit conceptions of who should go to the market or who's not? Who's suitable how, for what? How can capitalism overcome inequalities um, between men and women? Everybody who's not within this. And yeah, and everybody who doesn't identify that way and who isn't as accessible to the market. I think I can do it. Yep. Uh, lady over here. Yeah. Are we better at sharpening ideas alone or in a group? Are we better at sharpening ideas alone or in a group? Uh, yeah, I'll take a second. Remind me, just just one one word, just to remember, because I, I really don't. Climate change. I hate these three questions at a time because I can't remember. <laughs> um, climate change. Um, oh my God. Um, <laughs> Because unfortunately, unfortunately, your generation and, and maybe other generations, but particularly the younger you are, the more this is true. You kind of think that the world is going to end, I know, if, if something is not done. And it saddens me because you're not going to live a full, happy life because you're convinced that your actions are going to cause the end of the world any minute now. Um, I don't. Whether it's warming or not, I don't. I don't worry. 
Why don't I love it? But partially for, for reasons that you gave. We have amazing technology that can solve this stuff. Whether it's technology that will suck CO2 out of the air, or whether it's technology that will, bring, that will build dikes in Bangladesh. And I think the reason, by the way, that dikes are not being built in Bangladesh, it's, it's amazing to me that of all the topics discussed, including socialism, the only really religious topic is climate change and the NHS. Those are the two religions of Brits. Um, I mean, we, we, we can offend God, nobody would get upset, but God forbid I say anything about climate change, that really gets people going. Um, I believe that the technologies do exist, and I think, I think that is the ultimate solution to it. And in order to use those technologies, in order to be able to access those technologies, we have to allow technology to progress. We have to allow the freedom for people to invent new ideas, to come up with new technologies, and deploy them. And to do that, you have to be free. I think socialism is anti-freedom, and I don't think technology ever advances under, under socialism. We haven't even talked about that after the fact that socialism encourages absolute stagnation when it comes to innovation and ideas and creation and so on. Because it takes away the incentive, possibly because it takes away the incentive, but more importantly, because it dictates how you should think and what you should think for. There's no accident that socialism goes with authoritarianism almost always. Um, so I believe that the solutions are technological. Why would they be deployed given the profit motive? I'd say a few things. One is I can imagine ways in which we could convert CO2 into something fairly cheaply, and there's work being done in places like MIT and others to do that, where you could actually make money by converting the CO2 in the atmosphere into something usable for humankind. I also think that people are not only, and I know this will come as a shock to you, not only motivated by money. Capitalism is indeed not about money at all. Capitalism is about freedom. The essential characteristic of capitalism is freedom, and it's not an accident. The capitalism and freedom go hand in hand throughout the history of, of capitalism. And, and it's a bit of a, you know, I don't know what to call it, but to say it's capitalism in India. If you believe, if capitalism, again, I return to, if capitalism is private property, then how can capitalism be in India where the British didn't respect the private property of Indians? So it wasn't, it wasn't capitalism that did what it did in India. Maybe in England there was capitalism, but in India there was some form of authoritarian, you know, call it whatever you want, statism. But there was no private property in India. So you can't blame capitalism for what happened in India. It's the negation of the rights of Indians to their own property which caused the great famines and the great destruction that actually occurred in India. It wasn't bringing cap. If, if England, in its colonial mission, had brought capitalism to India, India would be one of the richest countries in the world today. And indeed, India, adopting capitalism a little bit, just a little bit in 1992, has become fairly wealthy as compared to when it was abided by socialist policies pre-1992. So again, just look at that. Look at the history. So I would say the solution to cap to, to it is the capitalist either finding ways to make money off of it or doing philanthropic work by building dikes in places, uh, by doing it through charity, by doing it through voluntary uh, commitment to the lives of human beings, which I think we all care about, particularly capitalists, because capitalism is the most caring ideology in human history. What was the second one? Oh, gender. Yeah, I mean, capitalism is the only system that is going to bring about any kind of true equality in the sense of equality in the sense. Equality of rights, equality of freedom, equality of liberty. No matter your gender, no matter your race, no matter the, no matter your gender, I guess, because now they're multiple. No matter any of that, you and the capitalism are treated by the law, by the legal system, equally. And then in terms, let me finish, in terms of pay, the best way to deal with gaps in pay is to outcompete them. So if, if it turns out that it's true, it's not true, but if it turns out that it were true, that if you took a male and you took a female lawyer, and the female lawyer was just as good and just as hardworking as the individuals, as the male, but was getting paid significantly less, then what would be a way under capitalism to solve that problem? Start, no, union. <laughs> union is like the dumbest idea ever. You want to really solve this problem? The way to solve that problem is to create an all-female law firm. And then you would outcompete the males because you were doing it at a low wage 
and you would beat them and you would beat their wages down. That is the beauty of capitalism. The beauty of capitalism is it rewards you for your productivity. It doesn't care if you're cis, it doesn't care if you're this gender or that gender or this color skin or that color skin. It rewards you for your ability and nothing else. So, all right, third question was, give me a word. Oh, collective, do we do, we do better in groups or as individuals? It depends, it depends. Some people work very well alone and come up with brilliant ideas alone. I don't think Newton or Einstein was very good at collaborative, uh, collaborative work and focus groups to come out with their theories. I don't think Darwin was either. I think they worked alone in a lab and focused and produced stuff. I think other people work very well in groups. But a group, a good group, a good group that produces ideas and produces products is a group of thinking individuals that each one is thinking and encouraging the other person to think, challenging them, stimulating them. So teamwork, nothing against teamwork, teamwork is wonderful. If it's a true team of individuals where you don't suppress your individuality for the group. So I think it depends on your style, on your ability, on, on, on the particular problem that you have to solve. I know there's certain problems. I need to go close the door, complete silence, and really, really focus on the particular problem. And another problem that I want to get a team of the best minds on the issue and, and collaborate with them. So it depends on the problem, it depends on your style. Sure, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, first I want to come back very briefly on a factual point. Um, the British did respect the property rights in India. First thing they did was they bought collection rights from the uh, tax collectors. They also imposed an act called the Zamindar Act in the 1790s, which actually gave private property rights to the Zamindars that defrauded the tax collectors. They introduced property rights to much of India. And then what they did is they completely neglected the upkeep of many of the irrigation systems, step wells and so on, which were the lifeblood of Indian agriculture. It collapsed and an estimated 30 million people died in the COVID period of the British Raj. That is what killed those people. Capitalism killed those people. But to move on from that question, what's the difference between crony capitalism and laissez-faire capitalism? Personally, I don't think there is one. I think that the two go together like love and marriage. They, they are the, the, marry, the marriage of the capitalist system, effectively. That even during the laissez-faire period, and the way I think of laissez-faire, I think of it more as like a, a policy or a period in history than, than a form, a distinct form of capitalism. In the kind of golden age of the laissez-faire period, the government was still acting in the interest of the most powerful capitalists. In fact, the whole of parliament was basically just a hall of manufacturers and, and uh, landlords and so on arguing about their different interests. Many of the acts that were brought in, even the factory acts actually, this is very interesting, many of the factory acts weren't necessarily brought in because the workers stormed parliament and forced them to, although trade unions were being formed and uh, the limitation of the working day and the limitation of uh, forcing children to work and so on was among their demands, so the class struggle definitely played a role in that, but one of the reasons why those acts were actually passed was because big manufacturers from places like Liverpool and Manchester stood up and said, you've got to do something about this because my workers have forced me to limit the working day to 10 hours. If the rest of you aren't allowed, if the rest of you aren't forced to do that, then I'm going to be at a competitive disadvantage. And eventually the tipping point was reached, and that's precisely why the state intervened to, uh, to impose those acts, which actually kind of touches also on what we're talking about with the European Union and this kind of like floor of rights and all this kind of stuff. Now that links to cronyism because Although I actually think the factory acts were a good thing and a step forward, and that's why they were part of the demands of the, the labour movement at that time, that we see today, for example, with the way in which the bank banking is regulated, the way in which the bailouts were carried out, because the bailouts were not a socialist maneuver. I'm a socialist, I want the nationalisation of the banks, I want the expropriation of the banks. What occurred in American Britain was the, the nationalisation of the banks' losses and the privatisation, effectively, of their, of their profits in Britain. We basically nationalised the Royal Bank of Scotland and then sold it off as a, as a loss. It's basically, this isn't socialism, this is the government acting like a really crap capitalist, like a really ineffective capitalist. And crap, that's not capitalism as well, that's the state's fault in that respect. But it's still absurd to suggest that that's in any way socialism. Um, personally, I think that capitalism, even if you set up, right, let's, let's set up a perfectly free, comp freely competitive laissez-faire system, eventually, as I explained in my introductory remarks, it leads inevitably to monopoly. And let's say your, your state defending private property rights, nothing else, no material thing, all you're doing is, uh, is defending private property as it exists. 
And it just so happens that you have a few people who own almost all of it, and if they go down, the entire ship goes down, their interests are going to be reflected in your policy. And I think the policy of almost all the world's nations reflect that today. I don't know if I was asked any of the questions that were directed to Yaron, but I'll give you. Um, yeah, just as a quick word of explanation, Matthew had to leave to catch his train to London. Oh, right. Yeah, we'll be taking the rest of the Q&A. We have about 20 minutes left. Would you prefer to do one question at a time now? or? I, I mean, it's up to you guys. It's walking so far. One question. I mean, that's fine. as long as you're willing to jog my memory, I'm fine. <laughs> well, let's do one question at a time. Any other question on the floor? Yeah, we'll go um, Yeah, we'll go uh, here, Jesse. Um, so I think the only ground on which Rand and Marx might agree is, is atheism. Um, and perhaps you guys as well, I don't mean to be presumptuous, but I'm assuming as much. Um, can you just reflect on the atheism of your respective sides, how it influenced the um, political and economic theories, or vice versa, how the political and economic theories may have led to the conclusion of, of atheism, um, and how it may differ from your opposing side? <laughs> That's a big question. Um, <coughs> look, atheism is not a philosophy. Atheism is not a set of ideas. Atheism is just the recognition that there's no God. That's it. Um, and there is no God. So I'm an atheist. Yeah. Uh, I recognize that fact. It doesn't say anything about what other political philosophy I might have or might not have. It doesn't say anything about uh, anything, about morality, about anything. It just says there's no God. So I don't think you can derive from atheism anything about a political system. I do think, though, that knowingly or unknowingly, socialists very much rely on the moral code instituted by Christianity. The moral code of the meek shall inherit the earth, you are your brother's keeper, uh, turn the other cheek, all of that. That moral code is very much a, a, um, a, a socialist moral code. So, and, and the idea of individual sacrifice, again, uh, you know, Christianity wants you as an individual to sacrifice to God and sacrifice to the poor, or sacrifice to something, and that is, that is the highest noble moral thing you can do. I mean, Marx just flips out God and puts in the proletariat where he needs to. And, and you get the same individual sacrifice, the, the idea of the individual doesn't matter. What matters is this big thing out there, this mystical. I think socialism is very mystical. It's, it's a lot of hand-waving about how stuff gets happens and how stuff, you know, when it's, when it's international, it just stuff happens. Um, so I think there's a, a strong relationship between religion and, look, every ideology out there uh, with the exception of capitalism, I think is connected somehow with religion. I actually think, again, I know a lot of, a lot of my so-called, my co-capitalist friends are religious, but I think at the end of the day, to be a true advocate for capitalism and to be a true advocate for a morality of capitalism, morality of individualism, you're gonna have to give up at least aspects, if not all, probably all, of your religious beliefs. Sorry, guys. <laughs> And that's why, again, that's part of why we're failing. And certainly in America, you see the rise of statism as the country becomes more and more religious. The least religious people in American history were the founding fathers. Counter to the stories of the conservatives, the founding fathers were best deists. And they were the least, and, and that's why they could be revolutionary. And the more the country has become conventionally Christian, the more it's become statist, redistributionist, regulationist, and anti-capitalist. So uh, again, capitalism to me is a separation of state from economics, not any of the mixtures we have today. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a big question, it's a fascinating question. Um, I don't think Marx substituted the proletariat for God. I think he, he substituted matter for God and, and the universe is totality. And he, he comes in following on from the philosopher that maybe influenced him more than any other, and that was Hegel. I don't have time to give you a summary of Hegel's views. But Hegel was religious. Hegel did believe in God. Um, his vision of God was uh, an extremely interesting one. He basically saw in God the totality of everything, and everything in constant movement and contradiction, which also meant that it was constantly changing as well. It's quite dense, and, but very interesting. Marx basically took a great deal of these ideas, but grounded, and this philosophy is called dialectics, by the way. He grounded this, dialectics, which isn't limited to Hegel, but actually goes all the way back to the ancient Greeks, like Heraclitus, it's fascinating stuff, don't have time to tell you all about it. Um, Marx took he uh, Hegel's dialectic, and he grounded it not in the supreme being, basically. The absolute idea is what Hegel called God, because he felt that there had to be, basically, it's almost, uh, you could compare it to one of Plato's like, platonic ideas, right? 
that it's the, the unfurling of this idea in reality that that is the process of being a nice God. We've got deep here, haven't we? Um, Marx took this and he grounded it not in God, the absolute deep idea up here, but in matter down here, in the real, the verifiable. And he saw matter as infinite and in a constant course of contradiction and change, in the same way that an atom is determined in some ways, the character is determined in some ways by that polarity between positive and negative. That's a contradiction. It's also, it, it's also uh, necessary to point out that an atom is in constant movement. There's no such thing as static matter. Nowhere. You will never ever find any static matter. And so that means that everything around us, whether they're religious or not, actually, every single thing around us is in constant movement, it's in constant contradiction, and also it's in constant change. I mean, look at history. I think all of us in this room, regardless of our positions, can accept that human society sorry, has changed fundamentally many, many different times. I mean, just look kind of ancient Roman society, or like hunter-gatherer society 20,000 years ago during the Ice Age. It's the fundamental changes linked to our material conditions. And that was the philosophical starting point for all of Marx's ideas. Marxist socialism wasn't just, we should, I don't know, be nice to each other or fair. There was no handway to the goal. It was actually uh, working out the history of humanity as it has reflected the material changes in our conditions. And I think some of Marx's ideas about re uh, uh, religion, sorry, are themselves remarkably profound, because Marx is credited as saying, saying that religion is the opium of the masses. But that's slightly a, mix, uh, a misquote, uh, because that line is in a quote. If you take the whole of the quote, what he's saying is that religion is the soul of a soulless world. The sigh of an oppressed creature is the opium of the masses. What he's saying is that in a world such as capitalism where it exists, where the great mass of humanity are oppressed, are ground down, all of the beautiful things about humanity and the universe in its totality, which we can all love and worship, whether we're religious or not, are, they're deprived of those things. They reach out and look for this kind of absolute idea, or for a saviour figure. These beautiful ideas, they reach out as, not so much as a, as a, a, a sedative, or something to make them drunk or you know, high, it's a painkiller. It's a way of being able to understand and deal with a society that does not care whether they live or die. Those are the very profound, profound ideas of Karl Marx on religion. And actually, that also gives us an opportunity to consider what, what is the future for religion. And that is an open question, probably we don't have time to, dis uh, to discuss. But I would say, as society changes, if we succeed in overthrowing this barbaric, defunct capitalist system, and instituting a new system on where the basis of the development of the individual is the development of everybody, which has always been a necessary part of human society, actually, then we can see the development of people's ideas. You know, that, uh, Garrett says that people need to be a little bit less religion or religious, or they need to take at least some aspects out of that in order for them to be able to get ahead. If that's what you want, the only way you're going to get it is by improving their lives, so that people aren't reaching out. People aren't setting out this side of the oppressed creature, so to speak. And that's precisely, I think, what Marxism offers. Does anyone have a slightly less serious question? <laughs> no, no, those are good questions. Any more serious questions? Good. Um, yeah. So this was more directed to you. I was wondering, um, in your ideal capitalist system, what role would central banks play, if any? And would the concept of currency continue to be nationalized, or would you consider a more free market system? Yeah, I mean, in my in my world, there would be no central bank. There would be competition for currencies, and if crypto turned out to be what the market desired, what the market wanted, I doubt it. But I doubt it. Crypto as it exists today, I think there's a there's an idea of how you can do crypto in a way that I think would sustain market pressures. Then so be it. But absolutely, I think one of the most destabilizing things that, that we've ever created economically is a central bank. I think if you want to study just a little bit of history, study the, the uh, free banking system that existed in Scotland during the middle of the 19th century and how it was crushed by the Bank of England because it wanted its monopoly. It wanted the state monopoly. Remember, these are state entities. Uh, it wanted to control all those, uh, all those Scottish banks that were doing fantastically well with, uh, with real competition. Any thoughts? Well, I, I would be in favour, uh, as a socialist, of uh, the expropriation of the banks as they exist, and yes, the continuing ex existence, I suppose you call it, a uh, central bank, which would play a completely different role. Basically, the immense resources of the, of the banks, and also the in incredibly important planning role that they play at the centre of the economy. Banks do play an important role in directing uh, production. Um, that would be under the control of society as a whole. 
But basically, the owner of the chip of these things would not simply be the state, it wouldn't just be a state owned bank, that's existed under capitalism as well. And it wouldn't simply be a means of producing the national debt. But actually, you would have in democratic assemblies, in workplaces, in neighborhoods, in schools, people directing, saying what they need, basically. It would be the most sensitive and most efficient feedback mechanism possible. Actually, just it's to talk about the role of democracy in a socialist economy, not just question of politics and being in a to tyranny, but also within the economy itself. Trotsky said that Leon Trotsky, the Russian Revolutionary, said that democracy, workers' democracy, is the oxygen of the planned economy. The reason he said that was not kind of as some high producing phrase to say isn't democracy wonderful, it's because that's how you know what needs to be produced at a given time. If you have a purely centralized, bureaucratized planning system, then that becomes extremely difficult. And that directing the unified productive resources of society is what my vision of socialism would be. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. No, I, I agree with this question is like for both of you because I don't know what, what the difference is. Why, why you consider that an insult, I consider that a compliment. No, Thank you. Okay. Well, I don't know, like, let's go to the Luna Park and play with our own controller. Um, to complete my question, for example, why, why there is no anarchist, right? There is no anarchist in the competition, so the, the question for the national team was like, for no reason. So I study on refugees and immigrants. If your hypothesis was true, an immigrant from every kind of like, you know, could come here to UK and stay and produce and work and have any rights he wants, right? Mm -hmm. He's out of trouble. So we don't, we don't live in a trouble for like socialists, right? We have like uh, political parties who appeal to a quite, you know, like <coughs> wide spectrum of people. So we, we come to people who are like low paid, um, mothers who, uh, who are long mothers, you know, like all other kind of uh, immigrants who cannot work because they expect for their asylum or their right to be recognized. So like socialism is like, I don't know if it has failed, I wish it, it didn't, but it, what I saw in Russia and in Cuba also, because I have Cuban friends, so they can tell me about what happens there, it's not actually socialist. And uh, yeah, for me, I'm the nationalist, right? I cannot explain that I have I have more rights than a Cuban or uh, an Indian. So for now, like, what do you expect about the TV? Because this is my well, this is my dissertation. So. I'll... <laughs> <laughs> What do you think we should do with the refugee problem? What, 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 what's your solution? What, what's your solution for the... My solution is that as long as Europe is a welfare state and refugees can come here and basically get welfare without necessarily producing and all the wonderful things you said they would do no, if they came here. They cannot come anymore. No, if. if. Well, okay. I mean, you're not asking a question, right? I, you asked me what should be done in the refugee crisis, and I said, as long as, as long as, Europe is a welfare state, as long as well, Europe is a welfare state, doling out checks to refugees in Germany and Sweden, and places like that, that's why they go there, they don't stay in other countries. It's not sustainable, it's an absurd model, and therefore there should be a stop to refugees coming over. But, in a capitalist world, where there is no welfare, where welfare is zeroed out, that's what a capitalist world actually looks like as compared to the mixed economy we have, I would support open borders. So I would support refugees coming because the only way they could come is they were willing and able to actually work and produce and make something for a living. And what if they went in company? Sorry, sorry, let's move on. There's a lot of people that want to ask questions, I'm sorry. Um, we have time for two short questions. Uh, gentlemen at the back, please. Uh, very bad. Yeah. One word, debt. How do you get out of that? I love the short question. <laughs> <laughs> in the world we live in today? Well, yeah. Well, I mean... <laughs> okay, I'll expand. Um, well, you don't have to. But. <laughs> <laughs> the, the mixed economy we have, uh, which is dominated by capitalist systems, is dependent on ever-increasing debt. 
So, so I think there are two forms of debt. One I think is sustainable, and one is, you're right, is unsustainable. Um, and I don't think that the world in which we live in today is dominated by capitalism. I think the world we live in today is dominated by the state and dominated by state controls and state regulations and state everything. Uh, the only sections of the economy that are left relatively free uh, are places like technology where you get massive innovation and those sectors of the economy that are dominated by the state, you get massive stagnation. You get actually massive deterioration. Uh, healthcare and education being two good examples of that. Um, but in terms of debt, the way you get out of debt is you produce more. And the way you produce more is you free up the economy. That is, you get rid of regulations and taxes and redistribution. You make the economy more capitalist in dramatic ways. The one form of debt that is not sustainable and therefore is going to devolve into a major crisis and will actually cause, I think, major financial crisis in the future is government debt. And governments who are now, you know, starting with Japan at 250% of GDP and the US going over 100% of GDP. And we, you know, that kind of debt is going to cause major crises, whether it's through the, the printing of money and creating inflation or other distortions that the printing of money does in order to pay back the debt, or whether through bankruptcy, although governments don't go bankrupt, they just print. They have a printing press. It's pretty cool. I wish I had one of those. Um, and they just print themselves out of it, and we suffer from the inflation that happens. Either way, we get screwed at the expense of the politicians and those in the politicians' favor. So I, view, I see a big difference between capitalism, and there's no such thing, by the way, as crony capitalism, because there are no forms of capitalism. There's cronyism. Cronyism is a form of statism. It can only exist when the state has power over us. I want, a, I want a system where the state has no power over us other than in protecting our individual rights, other than that it leaves us alone. And in such a, country, in such a state, there is no cronyism because there's nothing for business to gain because the government has nothing to give them. Sure, well, I mean, I think the, the person who posed the question made a uh, point to a very important fact that debt, not just state debt actually, but corporate debt, household debt, is rising worldwide. In fact, the total world debt, I don't think it's just state debt, I think it's total debt, is now, um, I think, 300% of world GDP. So that sounds a bit like a Ponzi scheme to me, to be honest. Uh, in terms of China, state debt in China isn't a surrender in other places, certainly not a surrender in, uh, as in Japan. You take total debt into account, you take corporate debt into account, then we're looking at 300% of GDP. And that's in the second largest economy in the entire world. I'd also like to talk about Sub-Saharan Africa, which you might remember in the early 2000s, I can't remember the exact date, unfortunately, maybe about 2004, there was an amnesty of African debt. The African states had become hopelessly indebted to other states, European states, and people felt, I think, justifiably that this was a legacy of colonialism. And it become, became a lead weight around the necks of these African nations. And so the right thing to do, the humane thing to do, still for capitalism, they weren't making them socialists, was to just annul the debt and then kind of start again, start fresh. They've done that. Now, this year, the debt, total indebtedness, of these African countries, the total level of debt in these African countries is now greater than at the time before the amnesty. But the problem is, and this is the Financial Times, which is not a Marxist publication, the IMF and other bodies, again not Marxist, are worried because this debt is no longer held by foreign states, it's held by, held by private owners and corporations who are going to be much less willing to take a haircut. Because if they take a haircut, then that's going to be very, very dangerous for them and the economy is concerned. In other words, what we're sitting on powder cake, basically. Debt on its own is deadly. Debt on its own doesn't just cause a crisis. Like, you reach a certain point of debt, and then we have a crisis. Otherwise, we would have had it already, wouldn't we? Because we're as indebted as we've ever been. What causes a crisis, ultimately, is, well, in my opinion, is when the system reaches a limit with overproduction. We're seeing signs of overproduction everywhere in the form of excess capacity in the steel industry. Its capacity usage is about 60%. And this is a big, big problem. It doesn't mean that the system immediately just collapses, but it basically means that when a slowdown comes, and incidentally, under capitalism, slowdowns are inevitable, that's why they always happen at regular intervals, then if all these countries, if the entire world is hopelessly indebted, the effects of that crisis will be even bigger than anyone before. I think that we are headed towards a world slump at a certain stage. I'm not the only one. 
There are plenty of people that definitely describe themselves as capitalists who are very worried about that, among the, the IMF. And when it happens, precisely because of these outrageous levels of debt, which are part and parcel of the system reaching its limit, then the effects will be absolutely enormous. I think we'll see some of the progress that's been made in places like Sub Saharan Africa and India, although I think it's limited, actually being reserved, reversed as a result of these things. And that's why, I, I, like, the last thing that I want to say about this is we can talk in the abstract about which would be the more, the best ideal system about whether an ideal version of capitalism would actually be better for everyone, or an ideal version of socialism would be better than everyone. And that's what we do. I think that is a fruitful discussion. It's been a very interesting one. But now we're looking at a system where we've talked about the climate crisis, which is not going away, and the possible solutions. We've talked about the question of debt. We're talking, and I don't think anyone would deny that a crisis is coming. I mean, maybe, maybe they would. What are we going to do about it? That's the essence of politics. It's the essence of philosophy. What are we going to do to change the world we live in? Because it isn't good enough. And that is the purpose of really what, the reason why I was so excited about having this debate. I think it has, it has borne fruit. Because what I would say to you is that what we have to do about it is not just to come to terms with how we want things to be better, but also to think about how we're concretely going to do that, how we're going to organise. I would say that the only way that we can overcome this problem is if the masses of the earth, if the working class actually takes production, takes economy into its own hands. It can be done, but I think that's the only solution. The way we can... Um, do move towards this, the way we can do this is to get political activity, to participate in the class struggle, in all these political struggles and economic struggles that are going on around the world, to educate ourselves and to devote ourselves to the overthrow of the system. And on that I'll finish, thank you. If you don't have any time for any time for any more questions, then we'll finish just with a few um, finishing uh, notes from speaking. Yes, I would say don't get deceived by a trick that I think is being, uh, you know, committed here. And that is to say that there's some ideal of socialism over here, and every single problem that's ever existed is caused by capitalism. Colonialism, that's capitalism. Uh, you know, mixed economy that exists today, that's capitalism. Everything is capitalism. So therefore, every crisis, every problem, everything is therefore capitalism. That is bizarre. What we live in today is a mixed economy, a mixture of certain elements of freedom, certain elements of private property, a little bit of everything, and a lot of state control, a lot of state control. The one thing the two of us will agree on is that we're heading towards a crisis. This mixture is not sustainable. Mixtures never are. At the end of the day, you asked about idealism. At the end of the day, ideals win out. You guys in the middle will lose. We're either moving towards socialism or nationalism, which I think is a, is a sister of socialism, but another form of collectivism, or we're going to move towards more freedom. We're going to move towards capitalism. We're going to move towards a system that is purely capitalist, which means the separation of state from economics, which means the protection not just of property, but all individual rights, which means the respect a freedom for the individual, no matter your gender, your race, your color, whatever, whatever, however you want to categorize yourself. It's about freedom at the end of the day, freedom for you as an individual. Do you want to live in a place that people are swimming away, escaping from, because it's so horrific, and where they're political prisoners, but it's called socialism, and supposedly it has good health care. I don't wish on any one of you to go to a Cuban hospital. Or do you want to live in a place where you can pursue your dreams, your values as an individual? You can take your ideas and make them real in existence. You can advance and achieve as much as you are capable of doing. Where your life is sacred. Where your life is what it's all about. A, a, a system that is free, where the government's only role is to protect that freedom that you, as an individual, have. Thank you. Just very quickly on a finishing note, thank you first of all, all of you for Oh, coming. subscribe to my YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a capitalist, after all. Well, that, but also, just thank you for coming. This really is a fruitful debate. It's good to have these debates. Next week, uh, on Wednesday, in the same lecture piece, we have Konstantin Kissin, um, who was famous for refusing to sign a behavioral agreement 
for his comedy sketch at Solas. And um, he was Jewish Comedian of the Year last year. He's coming to give a talk about unsafe spaces, about uh, should comedy be allowed to offend, and whether we should regulate comedy. Uh, so.